Bear down, Chicago Bears. Hello. Greetings, everyone. My name is Adam Pecora, and this is Requiem for a Tuesday. Thank you for tuning in. We got a sports movie episode for y'all today. Watched a couple oldies this weekend. Um, but first, let's do some plug-in. Instagram, Adam.rfat. Follow me up, baby. Rate, review, and subscribe to this very podcast on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and any place you can find podcasts. You'll likely find this one there as well. So go ahead, give me a review, give me a sub, and uh, that would be greatly appreciated. If you love the show that much, you can also get a little bit of merchandise at rfat.bigcartel.com. There's music as well. Check all the links in the description below. Lots of good stuff for everybody to stay entertained, hopefully. Um, Before we get into the films at hand, as the opening fight song may have indicated, preseason week one went off without a hitch. Uh, The Bears look spectacular. The roster, there's not really a hole at any position. Yeah, the O-line lacks depth. I would say, uh, I mean, every position kind of lacks depth, really. Running back's all right. You know, receiver depth isn't great. D-line depth, we'll see. That might be very deep. It might actually be weak overall. That's still the weakest part of the team. Linebacker, same thing, like just strong, but... Uh, The depth's actually all right there. Maybe not on the outside. Secondary, depends how good the rookies are. But if they're as good as everybody's saying, we're in great shape. Uh, And the safeties, same thing. No depth. But position by position, we're pretty solid. And, you know, DJ Moore, I love him. God bless. Two first-round picks next year. Look, I'm hoping for a wild-card push this year. Best case, um, at least good. No- they need to, ju- as I said last year, they need to just look good. And as long as we get seven to nine wins, that'll be great. Six, whatever. Two first round picks next year's the year they need to be guaranteed playoff team. So we'll see. Point being, the offense is looking spectacular. I've never had a feeling like this. I've said this many times, just as a Bears fan. The hope, the optimism, I felt it twice in my entire life, you know? Three times, three times. Super Bowl year, NFC Championship game year, double doink year. Um, All of them heartbreaking. Uh, So, you know. I, I mean, I don't know. It's like I've never felt what I feel about this organization where it's like Poles is going to make all the right moves. You know, Flus, he, he hasn't had a team yet, so I can't, I can't say for sure, but he seems like he's doing a hell of a goddamn job. Seems like everybody's doing a great job at their job. Um, and I have a natural urge to be skeptical, but... There hasn't really been a reason to be so far. So. We'll see. We'll see. But I'm hype. I am hype. You better believe it. Next up. Michael Orr. The story of the day. Couldn't believe my eyes. For those not privy to this news. uh, Broke today. Or, let's backtrack. You may remember the film The Blind Side that took the nation by storm. The story of how a poor young athlete was adopted by a rich white family and overcame adverse that adversity to then make it to the NFL. Uh, it was a lie. So that's great. Uh <laughs> 
This was very fascinating and honestly kind of shocking that this doesn't happen more, but it's just even better that because it was so widely publicized, they made the movie, they wrote the book, they did whatever else. God knows how much money they exploited. That This is actually now a fraud story. I love a good, especially modern fraud story because whenever you... You know, like, catch me if you can or whatever. Anything about mass fraud like this in the past, you just go, well, this isn't a mass fraud, but you get my point. Anything about a story where somebody can get around something like this in the past, it's always just like, man, I wish I lived back then. I could have thought of some scheme like that. Odds are you probably couldn't have. But it is just always alarming to hear just how easy it was to steal money at some point in time. Any time where it's like I got around some entire electronic surveillance system, I'm always thoroughly impressed if you can scheme something that to that nature. This is, I would say, worse because you're exploiting a person and also raising yourself up while doing it. This is more truly like sociopathic because I mean the gall really it's like did they see this many steps ahead were they planning it the whole time like did they want to just take in an athlete because they really felt bad I don't know the whole situation I didn't even see the fucking movie Because I don't, frankly, I don't really care. It's not about football. I'm not that interested. It's about the fucking mom. Like, I don't give a fuck. I don't like Sandra Bullock. Anyway, that is apparently a very controversial take. But she gets under, she gets under my skin. I don't know what it is. She bothers me. Okay. Um, I don't think she's that good looking either. I don't understand the beautiful Sandra Bullock thing. It's like, actresses are attractive. Just naturally, I understand. But, you know, put her in a lineup. I'm not picking. Anyway. (laughs) So apparently what had happened was Michael Orr, 17, turning 18, as he's being recruited into college or whatever happened there. Um, I believe he was homeless is the thing. Not 100% on that. But his living situation was not good if there was one. So they take him in. Now the story goes they adopt him, treat him as one of their own, and he lives in this nice cushy life. And it's like a fish out of water tale is the movie, I gather. And then they help him. They both help each other low and grow, grow and whatever. And then he ends up in the NFL, blah, blah, blah. What is now coming to light is that he... Did not sign any papers saying, yes, I am being adopted by this family and I'm chill about this or whatever, which I didn't know that was part of it. Do kids have to consent consent to being adopted? I mean, that does make sense to me and that's good, but I always felt like that wasn't true. So, hey, big ups for the whatever. The orphan system of America good for you on this one you got something right whatever that is they had him sign a conservatorship agreement which as we know from the whole Britney Spears saga they can take his money they can use his name he doesn't get a dime um I guess because he wasn't 18, that is why that this thing made sense. And they positioned it to him as like, well, once you're 18, we can't be adoptive of you anymore. So we'll sign you to this. This is like a longer term, more official thing. So that way you're really a part of the family. The key factor in all of this is that's the whole thing. The conservatorship mentions is not legally binding to him as their kin or whatever in any way. Whereas a real adoption thing, yes, he would just be a legal adult at 18, but he would literally be a part of their family 
Like, that's all the official thing signifies anyway. If once he's 18, he's 18, why does he need to sign anything? And, you know, obviously he was not in any position to know anything like that and was manipulated by people claiming to be his loving parents. Uh, so great stuff. Can't wait for the Blind Side 2, Blindsided, to come out. And, uh, yeah, the gritty reboot <laughs> of the Blind Side will be told how it actually happens. Uh, just great. What horrible people. I'm sure they'll come out with some counterpoint that it was all misconstrued. That's just how any lawsuit's going to go. It now has to seem like anybody could have been at fault. I don't imagine why at any point. Here's the thing. There's a slim, slim chance that Michael Orr is now in his, you know, significant post-playing days. Could use a lump sum of cash. Um, so there's a chance that he was aware the whole time and then, you know, had to construct a story that would allow him to get a lawsuit out of it. I don't buy that. Uh, it would be too embarrassing to reveal, frankly. It even says that he was embarrassed upon discovering it in the article that I read. And on top of all of that, if anything, the part that might be true is he might just need some cash. But this is a very legitimate opportunity and reason for him to do so. I'm rooting for Michael Orr. I didn't like this whole scenario in the first place. It was a distraction from the football season that I did not welcome, and it was a sappy, stupid, like, family women comedy. Not into it. Uh, so fuck this movie, fuck these people. Shout out Michael Orr. Hope you get your bread, son. But, in keeping with the football theme, the Chicago Bears intro, We've got a long overdue movie for y'all. This is the 1971 ABC movie of the week. Brian's Song. Widely regarded as one of the greatest made-for-television films of all time. Along with Duel by Steven Spielberg. Uh... Michael Mann's The Jericho Mile. And I think those are the only ones I know. And the rest of which that I would name are all Disney Channel original movies. Shout out Brink. Uh, this was also remade in 2001 with Mackay Pfeiffer. Who ain't the future of shit, bitch. He's just David fucking Porter. Uh, <laughs> it's the only reason I mentioned it. I had no intention of watching this, and I didn't even know it was made. Uh, so I'm sure the 2001 version is not good. This movie, on the other hand, was pretty good. Uh, it's, I mean, look, I just introed it with high praise from history, but... I was shocked. Uh, unfortunate that I hadn't seen it up to this point anyway, especially being a Bears fan, hearing about it my entire life. Seems like it's a much talked about movie. It's referenced quite a bit on a lot of things. A very impactful film for the time. What I did not know about this movie was the racial element. I feel like I would not really seen that discussed in a lot of things. But. Uh, good for them. I never. It honestly had never crossed my mind. Um, so I guess let's just get into it. For those who don't know. This movie is based on. A. Memoir. Of Gail Sayers. Gail Sayers, a legend in Chicago, was a running back for the Bears, was like the fastest dude ever, basically, at the time. So he just ran past everyone for years and tore shit up. Was a great kick returner as well. And, you know, back in the day, the medical capabilities were limited. He blew out his knee and was never able to play again. I don't know. Could have been as catastrophic 
Those injuries still exist today. They're just much more rare. Could have been to that level. Who knows? He may have just torn his ACL, in which guys back guys are back in six months now. May have ended his career. I don't know. Not relevant, really. So this is about him entering the NFL. It begins uh, as he shows up as a rookie, fellow rookie, Brian Piccolo. By the way, Gail Sayers, Billy D. Williams, okay, little Lando action before that happened. I mean, this has to be one of his first roles. I didn't look into that either. Um, actually, I'm going to check right now. What was Billy D. Williams' first role? Return to painting? Well, I don't know anything about Billy D. Williams. Was Is he a prolific painter? I'm sure most people know this. Uh, I'm going to get... We, there may be a profile on Billy D. Williams coming up. Uh... His film debut was in 1959, so either way, way off. Anyway, <laughs> James Kahn, yes, the James Kahn, co-stars as Brian Piccolo, a fellow rookie who greets him as he pulls up to the facility, pulls a little prank on Gale Sayers tells him that George Hallis, famed owner and founder and coach and GM of the Bears, uh, has bad hearing in one ear. So Gale Sayers spends the whole meeting kind of walking around him trying to get on his good side. And then at the end, it's revealed that obviously that was a prank. Honestly, pretty solid comedy stuff going on throughout this movie. Uh, the drama actually is what's very heavy, heavy handed and kind of like soap opery. Um, but the chemistry between the guys, first of all, they do a great job of building it throughout the movie. Like they, it is weird and awkward at first and then it does feel very natural and seem like they're actually good friends. So kudos to all that. Um, soon after that. He gets him back. They're at like a team dinner thing. Uh, Sayers ends up making Piccolo stand up and do a fight song somehow. I don't really remember how that happened. It was kind of odd. And then puts mashed potatoes on his chair when he sits down. Now, what was odd to me, he scoops the potatoes out of the tray and then puts them on his seat. It's not good for the seat. Just put your whole tray down either way. It's a lot more. It's like if your whole thing is like, I don't want to waste a meal. It's like you're in the NFL. Uh, have some fun. I don't know. You're supposed to be kids. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So they are shown in practice together. Obviously, Gail Sayers is doing fucking amazing shit the entire time. Brian Piccolo. You know, the only reason anyone knows who Brian Piccolo is is because of this movie. For those of you listening who are not privy to football the name brian piccolo is known as a name because of what happens in this movie so i didn't know that he was if he was any good or not he apparently wasn't but you know good enough to make the team whatever um and effectively what this movie kind of says is that he kind of just stayed on the team because he was friends with gail sayers which hey that's great that's still a thing to this day and there's nothing wrong with that Tom Brady kept a lot of guys paid. Aaron Rodgers is keeping a lot of guys paid. It's all good. Uh, so they get placed together as roommates and there's kind of a speech like, hey, just so you guys know, like this is going to be a big deal. And they're like, why? And they're like, ah, you kids. Wait till you see what's going to happen. Uh, and then they don't really show anything of that. They could, they just kind of make it a point for the movie to tell everyone, like, hey, this was a big deal, and we'll tell you what they will deal with, but we're not going to show, like, racist people screaming at them. We'll just tell them that it happened, which I think was probably a wise move. Uh, so anyway, their wives end up becoming friends, and then... 
yeah, they just kind of show a lot of scenes of them like hanging out and laughing. There's just a lot of good male friendship stuff in here. Uh, Gail Sayers injures his knee, is very depressed, and it, again, very comically soap opera y shown all of this stuff. It's a little silly. But also, I will mention, they this movie's like 100 minutes, or I'm sorry, it's like it was made for like a 90 minute time slot and the movie itself is like 70 minutes. So they didn't have a lot of time. They had to keep it kind of lean. So I also do understand that, you know, made for TV, all that type of stuff. It is a factor into why this isn't fucking Al Pacino quality acting in the movie. While they had it, you know, great actors. Um, so then after that, yeah, he hurts his knee. Piccolo surprised him with like a gym in the basement. And then, uh, then it's revealed that they switch Piccolo to fullback so they can play together. They, their bond gets even stronger. Uh, and then all of a sudden Brian Piccolo starts to lose weight and he starts to move slower and he's like, oh, I don't know what's really going on. And he's really fatigued. And then they're like, oh, he has cancer. And then they're like, they're going to remove his lung. And then that's when there's like a team dinner. That's when there's that famous scene of Billy D going, I love Brian Piccolo. (laughs) And uh, that is parodied quite a bit. Um, And I thought that was like, oops, drop my phone. You heard it. That's fine. Uh, (laughs) That is then when that's not the end is my point i thought that was like a post-death speech it's actually a pre-operation speech he then goes gets the operation the news is bad brian piccolo then dies um brian piccolo's number is retired by the chicago bears and uh yeah it's rough And then, uh, yeah, there's a really rough scene of them, like, saying their goodbyes. Listen, your boy teared up, couldn't handle it. Just a great film. Uh, The hype is real. I don't really have a lot else to say. Um, I don't know why they remade it. I mean, it was, like, the 30-year anniversary, and it was also just for TV, but kind of crazy. I'm pretty sure they used real highlights of Gale Sayers and, you know, they didn't try to just like do on field filming stuff, which made a lot of sense. The greatest thing about telling a true story. And yeah. Uh, Go Bears. Really, uh, really great stuff. Absolutely devastating, but uh, great performances. And now we're going to tie it over real quick. I I don't have a lot to say on this one either, but we're going to go to bang the drum slowly here. A little slight Godfather connection here, James Caan to Bobby De Niro. Um Michael Moriarty is the star of this movie, along with De Niro, famously of The Stuff, which is a fun movie that I've talked about on this show. Love that movie. Um, De Niro with the run of a lifetime, starting with this movie. Like, he's really good in this movie. And this movie, I heard about a lot as a kid for being one of, like, the greatest sports films of all time. Uh, That... You don't hear it brought up that much anymore, and I think it's more for the influence. It's more for the... This movie does a whole, like, this is a day-to-day job thing, which was unheard of at the time. It was all, like, the glory of the Yankees and that type of shit. So I think that's more of what this is famous for. I don't know how well it holds up. Like, it's a fine movie. Oh, You know, I, I'm not upset that I saw it. But it doesn't, I don't know. The legacy doesn't ring through to me. But this is, so this is like his breakthrough role along with Mean Streets, both in 73. Then he goes Godfather 2, 74, Taxi Driver 76. Those are four movies in a row of his. 
just what a god. Uh, fucking love Bobby D. Probably the greatest actor who ever lived in my book. Fucking love this man. Um, so this movie weirdly follows a pretty similar path, but it's based on a novel from 1956. So didn't bite... Brian song but very connectable so it starts uh essentially Robert De Niro's like a dumb fuck they don't say he's retarded because he's not retarded he's a pro b- baseball player but he's a dumb fuck and no one likes him because he's a loudmouth dumbass who chews tobacco and smells bad and whatever Moriarty is a pitcher holding out for his contract who's a very smart man. He wrote a book about shit. They don't really explain what and sells insurance to fellow players as a way to make money on the side because he's smart and a good businessman and all that. So he's also like the de facto team leader because everyone listens to him because he's smart and a nice guy and he's funny and everybody likes him and he's talented and all that. So he's a pitcher. His roommate is De Niro's character who is a catcher. They, he goes with him to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, he has cancer. They go to his house in Georgia. He burns all of his stuff as a, like, you know, metaphor for his life ending about, like, his baseball career. He meets his family. This is all very brief in the intro, and it's kind of slow and kind of a slog. And then once, then they go to, like, a hotel, and they just intro some more characters and some more themes. Like, they play this made up card game to swindle people and, like, whatever. That's a very long intro. Then the movie kind of hits a groove and it goes into the dog days, baseball, uh, spring training through the season. The team sucks, whatever. And they just kind of show how nobody really likes De Niro's character. But obviously being the only guy who knows of the illness, he keeps sticking up for him. And more and more people basically find out by default And the team kind of rallies around the guy and he kind of develops having friends and it kind of just becomes the only good time he ever really had in his life and everybody's on board. Meanwhile, there's a side plot where he has a girlfriend who all of a sudden is around now that she knows she's trying to steal his money, but the pitcher uh, like won't change the will and then she keeps that kind is all kind of unnecessary. doesn't really add anything Um, because the story's kind of half assed, honestly, It's they could have just focused it all on the relationship between the guys. Um, They didn't need to add the family thing. It didn't really do anything. And honestly, the send off wasn't that emotional. Uh, It didn't feel like he was dying really most of the time other than they just kept saying it. And then there was a really good moment in his room, though, where he thinks it's coming up um, and he's going to have to step away from the team. But then they just pivoted away and they're like, oh, that was nothing. And it's not explained very well, frankly. And then all of a sudden he's like, okay, now I'm sick for real and I have to fly away. And then they just do voiceover and they're like, the team did really good. We won the World Series and then he died. But I didn't send him. You know what I mean? And he's like, I didn't send him the scorecard before he died like like I said we would. And it's like, I thought you were his best friend. Like, you went to the mail clinic with him and all this stuff. It's like, all of a sudden, you're not going to fly out and go see him when the season's over? You're like, the season ended, and then I didn't send him the card, and then he died. It's like, why didn't you go see him? It was just very odd and off-putting. It's like, there was a good chunk in the middle of this movie where it made sense, and I can see why it's acclaimed for its portrayal of what it's like to be on a team in the middle of a season of some guys don't like each other people don't get along this and that you do little things to get by you play games hanging out at the hotel going to dinners like i get how it paved the way in doing all that type of stuff i get how de niro was great i get yeah no that's it uh I don't see how, as a complete movie, this is recognized as anything. Fl- frankly, the structure of it was fucking weird. And look, it's cool to see an early De Niro performance. Look, they're wearing the Yankees uniforms, but they're called the Mammoths for no reason. And then Pittsburgh. 
I believe they like explicitly didn't say pir- pirates. There was something weird with that. There was something with Boston that was weird, but then they clearly had Red Sox uniforms on. I don't understand it. It was cool to see just regular uniforms, but then it's weird to call them a different name because then that's even more of a disconnect. And like they were in the Yankees uniforms, but they were at home at Shea Stadium, and it was just all very odd little things. Um, and then it was like, thanks to the MLB for participating. So it's like, why couldn't they just be the real names? Why? Like, glad you got something, I guess. And I'm sure that was their mentality, too. Just odd little things about it that were very just like 1970s. Like, well, we're just making the movie, so it doesn't really matter what happens. Like, this is all we're really trying to do. That's all fine and good, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, an interesting juxtaposition to Brian's song, though. Whereas one, there wasn't the like the whole team hated Brian Piccolo and it took this illness to rally around. Like "Bang the Drum Slowly" is like Brian's song mixed with Rudy. I guess it's like "Bang the Drum Slowly" is like. R- Robert De Niro's character is Brian Piccolo mixed with Rudy because everybody hated him at first and then he got cancer and people liked him and rallied around him. Which, either way, I love, according to Joe Montana, nobody actually ever liked him no matter what. Like, that whole part of the story is made up. Uh, I love that. Um, Look, I think that that Bang the Drum Slowly could be remade a lot better as a mini series, and I don't think that a lot. But I think if the whole goal, like with um, Bull Durham, which I also actually haven't seen, that's on the on the long list somewhere, um, where you're trying to just show what it's actually like to be a part of a team. I I am always very interested in those type of stories, and there aren't too many of them really out there. Or ones that are really trying to do it seriously. But I think even the way like Winning Time, that show on HBO is now, is great. Because you're watching what people talk about in the locker room. And how these dynamics really are. And how the business elements of it are all there. Because that was also a part of Bang the Drum Slowly. There's some contract negotiation stuff. But it's a little, it's all a little half-baked and all like a little bit there. And was considered a huge thing at the time for being portrayed, period. Um, but I think more depth and like more focus on it would be more interesting because you almost don't need the player to be dying in bang the drum slowly. I think that that's almost the bigger flaw is like, what if, I don't know, like what if the pitcher just saw something in him that no one else did? Like, I don't really know how to explain that because obviously just through scouting and whatever that would be there. Uh, but they almost they make it a point in the movie like he never really got a lot of playing time and once he did he started to play a lot better than anybody thought because he was actually pretty decent which then led to people getting along with him more so all of that's there anyway it's like you almost just need a reason for him to be in the lineup like there, he should be the backup that nobody likes because either way like they mentioned they're planning to trade him down and the player they're planning to trade him down for is a country boy who sings the song bang the drum slowly which is why the title makes sense either way or they just kind of uh, reference the title in the movie, which is always kind of nice. But either way, my point is just he could have been the guy that they were about to trade down. Only this one pitcher, you know, uh, vouches for him and tells him everybody should get a chance. Everybody hates him. They're going to send him down. Then all of a sudden, boom. A starter gets injured, he starts catching for everybody and starts hitting well and the team gels together and so on and so forth. And the rest of the movie can still happen as is. To me, you're trimming a lot of fat. You don't need the girlfriend subplot. You don't need the family subplot. You can still do all the front office stuff with negotiations. You could do the day-to-day stuff with the manager and the teammates, the hotel, the travel. All that good stuff is all still there. And... All the parts that didn't work of this movie are gone. Um, Obviously, it would be a big change from the source material, which they were apparently very faithful to. I don't know. Watch Brian's song. Free to watch on YouTube, actually. Somebody just uploaded it, and they let it happen. 
Bang the drum slowly. I did have a DVD copy I got for like three bucks on eBay, but I'm sure it's a cheap watch somewhere else as well. Rapid fire ending to this episode. Thank you for tuning in. I'll be back next week. We're not doing bi-weekly going forward or anything like that. Um, so yeah, the next few weeks in a row will be good. Labor Day, no episode, because I will be out of town partying. Uh, but then otherwise we are back to weekly as normal rate review and subscribe to Requiem for a Tuesday, please, please, please. And thank you. Tell your friends, share the episodes. Let's get the word out of here. We got to get these numbies up, um, YouTube as well. If you're interested, everything's linked in the description below. Check out all that good stuff that I be working on. And remember, I are fat. You are fat. We are fat calculator